So now it's a pleasure to have the first lecture by uh, Lucas uh, Madeira, uh, who will uh, present some uh, numerical methods uh, for the simulation of uh, quantum systems in the context of uh, atomic physics. So <coughs> Lucas uh, obtained his PhD from uh, Arizona State University in the state in uh, 2018 on uh, quantum Monte Carlo uh, methods with, uh, for strongly interacting systems. Since then, uh, he has uh, been doing a postdoctoral stay in, uh, the s in San Carlos, in the state of San Paulo, in the cold atom group of uh, van der Leyen Bagnato, uh, doing simulations of, uh, again, uh, strongly interacting systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an experimental group that studies uh, turbulence and vortices uh, dynamics. Um, so, Lucas, uh, thank you, and please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roman, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation, you, Patrice, and Raul, for the invitation uh, for this topic that I love to talk about. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? I, I'm feeling more machine than man today because I look like Robocop, right? So the idea here is to uh, give you guys an opportunity for some hands-on exercises. So I know that you had lots of uh, lectures on theoretical aspects of uh, the interaction of light and cold atoms. So the idea here is to provide some concrete example that you can develop some code, that means programming, okay, to tackle some uh, simple problems that they're simple from the technical point of view, but they're rich in physics, okay? Um, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Uh, most of them are going to be yes, no, simple questions. So for those, you don't have to pick up the microphone to, to, to answer. But if you do have questions, uh, please uh, let me know. And I don't mind being interrupted. This is, and think of this as an exercise class. So if you have questions, please do ask, OK? And Oh, Lucas, uh, this question is pretty basic. Uh, I mean, this question, uh, it's not going to be interesting. No, please do, because if you're thinking about it, probably somebody here in the audience is also thinking. Okay, so I really want you guys to participate. So this is the program that I, I have in mind for the uh, this uh, for our lectures. Today, we're going to start with some, uh, with a numerical method to solve the uh, time independent Schrodinger equation for a simple potential. And today I'm going to talk what's the strategy behind this method, the algorithm. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about which units should I use when I'm programming. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about numerical calculus, so uh, numerical differentiation and uh, integration. And then we are going to apply all this we learned to a simple potential, 1D potential, the infinite square well. The idea that uh, is that today I'm going to present this for you. You can ask questions about the method or, or the physics. And next lecture tomorrow, we will have time to uh, develop the code to, to solve this problem, okay? If we have time, we can start today. I, I don't know, depends on how many questions that I get. Yes? <laughs> will the codes be available? So the idea here is that you develop your own code. So um, I'm going to show some results that you can use as benchmarks, that you can compare what you write against them and see if it's correct or not. But I, I chose this uh, simple potential because uh, I imagine that from quantum mechanics uh, courses, you have a pretty good idea what the result should be so that it should be easy enough to know if you're getting it right or wrong, okay? And then, uh, so tomorrow will be this code, develop, code development, uh, lecture number three, that will be uh, Thursday. So we're going to talk about scattering. That's probably something that you heard a lot uh, <laughs> uh, this week, last week, okay? But uh, I'm going to talk about it with focus on applying it to a, a real problem. That's going to be the spherical well. Okay, so the idea is that you're going to write a code to compute the scattering length of the spherical well, okay? And um, 
from the technical point of view, from the programming point of view, it's even easier than what I'm going to talk about today. But the idea is that the physics here is a little bit more complicated, okay? And then on Friday, we can develop the, uh, the, the code for this uh, spherical well. And when I say develop the code, I'm not going to lock you here with your computers and ask uh, well, what's the correct result. No, I'm going to be here in the room. Then while you're programming, you can uh, call me, you can ask questions, okay? So that's the idea, to be an interactive session. Sounds good? All right. So uh, I've given uh, several versions of this course, and I always get this uh, question, which programming language should I use? Use the one you're most familiar with, OK? Here, I'm going to describe the algorithms with words, with physics, so that you can implement on whatever you feel more comfortable with, OK? No res restrictions on the language that you should use. Can I attend the lectures without developing my own code? Yes, in principle you can. You can sit here, listen to me, or do something else. But then if you don't, this is particular to scientific programming, programming in general. If you don't sit down and, and try to implement it yourself, uh, I mean, there is no point in doing that. Because when I'm doing this on the board, it, it's going to look easy, hopefully. Okay, and but when you start programming, that questions arise. Okay, so if you really want to take the most out of this course, I recommend you try to do it. Oh, Lucas, I, I, I'm not so good at programming. I, I didn't finish this during the school. Fine. When you go back to your institution, if you still want to work a little bit on it, and you have questions, please email me, and, and I'll try to help you guys. Okay. Are you going to grade the projects? Well, this is a school, but I'm not going to do that, OK? I'm going to present some results, some benchmarks, some numbers, so that you can compare your results against and see if you're getting things right, OK? But I'm, I'm not going to assign you grades. Uh, which uh, software should I use to plot the figures? Again, the same question as uh, the programming language. Whatever you feel most comfor comfortable with, OK? Uh, can I discuss the, pro uh, the programs that I write with other students? You should, okay? If you have any questions, or even when you're developing your own code, please talk among yourselves. Maybe if you have some difficulty, uh, somebody next to you can help you, okay? So uh, I really want you guys to, to talk to each other and talk to me too, okay? And this is a school, so you get homework. What's the first homework? set up an environment to write, compile, and run your codes. So if you have your computers with you, you can do that. Probably uh, we'll have a room here with computers. I'm not sure yet. But if you have your own computers, pre please br bring them to class and make sure that you can uh, run your code. Any questions so far? OK. Um, Pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about today and everything you need for the, uh, developing these codes, you'll find in my slides. They are available at the web page of the, the school. So if you go to, I don't remember, uh, files and attachments, something like that, look for my name, and then you'll find th this exact same file. Okay. Uh, but if you want a book to, to study computational physics, uh, I recommend this one, Computational Physics by Giordano. And uh, it has not only applications to quantum mechanics, but also ENM, statistical physics, classical mechanics. So if you want to try some simple problems and, and some complex ones too, uh, this is a really good reference. If you want to read more about the things I'm talking about today, uh, this week, uh, it, it's chapter 10. Uh, that's the first chapter, the chapter that uh, they talk about quantum mechanics, okay? And I know you guys are really resourceful. You can find this book. Wink, wink. <laughs> okay? So what's the simplest thing that we can tackle as a first problem in quantum mechanics? Time independent, one dimensional Schrodinger's equation for one particle, okay? doesn't get 
simpler than that. Well, it does if we did the free particle, but we're going to, to put some potential, otherwise uh, it's too easy, okay? So only a few problems can be solved analytically in, in quantum mechanics. I'm sure this past uh, week uh, you saw some really nice analytical results, but they are the exception. Most problems, most interesting problems in quantum mechanics, they don't have analytical solutions. I'm not saying analytical solutions are bad. No, they're really good for learning and, and for really seeing uh, the physical content of your problem. But the thing is, uh, you might get the wrong impression from textbooks that everything can be solved analytically, okay? Because in undergraduate and graduate courses, we see the harmonic oscillator, particle in a box, hydrogen atom, and we have this uh, wrong impression. So, if we can't do things analytically, what can we do? We could do perturbative methods. They are uh, uh, really important, uh, and you st still can get some nice analytical results. But in general, we have to resort to numerical methods, okay? So as I said, uh, in this lecture, we're going to see the time-independent solutions uh, for one particle in 1D for the Schrodinger equation for a particular potential here. And we are going to take a different approach from the one that we do when we solve uh, things analytically. When we solve things analytically, we get a wave function that we know its values in a continuous time, um, in a continuous uh, range of x, right? You can put pretty much any x there that it, you get the wave function. Here we are going to do something different. We are going to discretize space. So we have some interval that we want to know our wave function in 1D. And I'm going to put a lattice of equally spaced points on this uh, one-dimensional axis here. And then I'm going to convert my problem into finding the wave function, not everywhere, but on this discrete set of points, of lattice points, okay? So I'm going to write my, my uh, discretized values of x as xi. They're equally spaced by delta x with i an integer, okay? And then uh, we cast this problem, this problem becomes determined psi on the lattice points. Is it clear the strategy we're going to take? Questions? Okay. Uh, yes. So before we talk about actually solving the Schrodinger's equation, let's stop for a second and talk about the units. Here's the equation. And then I wrote down some typical uh, uh, quantities if we are doing, uh, dealing with electrons, for example. It didn't have to be electrons. I'm just, uh, this is just a, a for instance. Well, h bar uh, is of the order of 10 to the minus 34 Julie second, okay? It's a really small number. The electron mass is time, uh, 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. If you're dealing with electrons in, in a solid, for example, the energy and the potential are in the EV scale. That's 10 to the minus 19 joules. The distances are typically one angstrom, which is 10 to minus 10 uh, meters, right? So when we start to plug in these values in the equation, we, we see that we're multiplying and dividing it by really small numbers. And uh, if we're doing things analytically, there's no problem, right? You just keep track of the powers of 10 and everything works, right? What's the problem if we try to do this in a computer? Well, in a computer, the variables, uh, the space that you have to, to store your numbers is finite. So you have uh, problems representing uh, numbers, real numbers in computers, right? There's some space uh, that's uh, uh, available to represent the number, and then some space available to represent the power of the, uh, the 10 to some power, right? So when you start dealing with really small numbers or really large numbers in computer, problems may arise, okay? So when we are uh, dealing with uh, this, this problem in a computer, usually we want to solve some equation that looks like this, right? And uh, this is the, the, the very common, there's a very common phrase, set h bar equals m equals one, right? Have you done this before in some course or in your research? Yes? Uh, this is familiar to you? Okay. 
after, so I, I represented things uh, with bars here when I did this transformation, okay? So when you solve your problem in your computer or even analytically, analytically you might want to do this because you don't want to keep writing H bar and M everywhere, okay? You get at the end of your program or your solution and you get, oh, this, uh, the energy here is five in this unit. Then you have to go back to the original problem, right? So you have to uh, recover the units, right? Is that easy? When you do this, do you have confidence when you, you recover the units? Yes? No? Sometimes? I never recover the units. <laughs> the, the most difficult thing about physics is recovering the units. Top 10, in my opinion, okay? So this is tricky, right? So I'm going to show you a procedure uh, that hopefully make it makes it more clear what you have to do to recover these units, okay? So in the end, we want to solve this equation, but at some point, we want to recover the units, okay? So I'm going to choose some typical length scale L. It's a typical length scale of my problem. If I'm dealing with the electron uh, example, it could be one angstrom. Um, if I'm dealing with nuclear physics, it's 10 to the minus how much? 10 to the minus? 10. 10 to the minus 10 is one angstrom. That's still atomic physics, solid state. 15? 10 to the minus 15, or uh, as we like to call it, one Fermi, 10 to the minus 15. So you choose some length scale that makes sense for your problem, okay? It doesn't have to be a round number, as I said. If you're dealing with atomic physics, uh, sometimes you want to do uh, a bar radius, for example, okay? And then I'm going to scale all my, my quantities that depend on the distance, like x, by this quantity here, okay? So as I said, I'm going to put bars over everything that's dimensionless, okay? So that's my notation. Everything that doesn't have the units is going to have a bar on top of it, okay? Okay, so if we look at this equation, Schrodinger's equation alone, we, we cannot figure out what are the units of the wave function, right? Because Schrodinger's equation is linear in Psi, right? And it appears in all terms here. So if we want to determine the units of Psi, we have to look at other equations. For example, the normalization of the wave function. In the normalization of the wave function, in 1D, we have that Psi square, if I integrate over all space, has to be equal to 1. 1 is dimensionless, right? So the x here has units of length. Psi square must have units of uh, 1 over length. So the wave function has units of length to the minus one half. Everything uh, is everyone comfortable with this? Yes. Okay. So this is the pre prescription if I want to recover units for my wave function, right? If I have my dimensionless wave function that I solved in my code, I just multiply it by l to the minus one half, and then I get the thing with the correct units. Sorry. Yeah. Why does C have this dependence on L to the minus one half in the units? Yes. So the right side has no units here. Mm -hmm. So the left side must have no units also, OK? Yes. You are integrating over the position here, dx. Yes. Position has uh, units of length. Mm -hmm. So psi square has to have units of length to the minus one, so that you cancel all the lengths. But it's squared here, so you get a root here. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So if I do this with my position, this has an implication uh, on the second derivative that appears in Schroeder's equation. I get L squared here. Okay. So if I plug that in, in my uh, Schroeder's equation here, I get this prefactor here. That's h bar square divided by ml square. And if you look at this, this has energy units. It must have, right? Because the potential has units of energy, E has units of energy, so this thing here must have energy units, okay? So I'm going to define 
uh, this quantity epsilon here, which is uh, this uh, this ratio of h bar square to ml square. Okay. And then I'm going to use it to scale both my potential and my energy and my eigenenergy. Okay. And then I get exactly the same equation that I wrote a couple of slides ago. But now it's clear what I have to do. I solve my problem using this dimensionless equation, right? And then in the end, I have to use these simple rules here to convert forth and back from dimensionless to dimensionful uh, quantities. For the guy that said that this was the most difficult thing in physics, is it better now? A little bit. Okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Does this make sense? Yes? Good. All right. So we want to write the code to solve the infinite square well. I'm going to just do a, a brief recap on how to get the analytical solutions, okay? So, the infinite square well, I, I think you are all familiar. Uh, it's infinite, I have an infinite potential outside of the well, and inside of the well, I have a zero potential. I'm going to write it as going from minus big L to uh, big L, okay? So it has 2L uh, length, okay? Well, uh, if X is bigger, uh, if x is outside of the well in uh, either direction, since the potential is infinite, my wave function has to vanish, okay? It has to go to zero. And in the region inside of the well, we just have to solve this equation for, uh, it's the same equation that you get for a free particle, okay? I'm going to define uh, my wave vector k as the usual definition here. We get this di differential equation here, that's, you all know the solution. Is everyone comfortable with all of this? Okay. Too slow, too fast, right pace. Right? Okay. So, I have my solution here. Now I impose my boundary conditions. Uh, on both endpoints of the well, the wave function must vanish. Okay? So, uh, I have this first equation here. The second one, I get sine, uh, sine of minus KL. That's minus sine of KL. Sine is an odd function. You're going to hear me say that 1,000 times today. And cosine is an even function. So cosine of mi minus KL equals cosine of KL. Also, I'm going to say 1,000 times today. But keep this in mind, because this is what's going to help us solve the, the problem. Okay, so if I take the sum of these two equations that I have here, the terms with A are going to cancel, I get this condition here, 2B times cosine of KL equals zero, right? So I want a non-trivial solution. What does it mean, a non-trivial solution? I don't want both A and B equal to zero because then the wave function will be zero, I have no particle. I want a particle inside the well. So I have two cases. For the first case, I can take B to be zero, and then, of course, A has to be different than zero. But what condition do I, do I get? I get that sine of KL must be equal to zero. And I'm going to write this K with this minus subscript here because uh, I already know the answer. It's going to be convenient to, to divide things like this. So sine of KL equals zero. So uh, K minus must be pi over L, 2 pi over L, 3 pi over L, and so forth, has to be n pi over L with n integer, okay? I can have another case in which A equals zero, and I have non-zero B, wi for which I have cosine of KL equals zero. So I have K equal, equals being pi over 2L, 3 pi over 2L, 5 pi over 2L, an odd number times pi divided by 2L with and integer. Textbook quantum mechanics, not even that. Textbook modern physics, right? Good. So, uh, what are the, uh, the these functions for the 
even parity uh, states, that's the ones with cosine, and the uh, ones for the odd parity states, the ones with sine. They're here, right? The ground state is this one here. The first excited state is this one here, and, and, and so forth. There, are, I didn't normalize them, that's why they're in this arbitrary um, amplitudes here, but it wouldn't be hard to normalize these wave functions. Are you guys comfortable with this? Yes, good. So these were the uh, eigen uh, functions. Now we have the eigen energies. They are h bar square, k square divided by 2m. I just plug in the k square from the previous slide. And then I get the eigen energies for uh, both the even and odd parity states. Now, uh, if we use the, those uh, dimensionless quantities that I was talking about in the beginning of the lecture, I can use the typical length scale L, so half of the size of the well as my typical length scale, and then my well runs from minus one to plus one, okay? And uh, my uh, dimensionless energy I have to multiply by ML square and divide by H bar square, uh, square which they take these uh, simple forms here, and we can see that the lowest energy possible would be uh, this one here, uh, which would be uh, pi square over eight. That would be in those dimensionless uh, units, the energy of the ground state. And as I said, uh, it's really important to notice the parity uh, of the solutions. The cosines are even, because if I flip the sign here, it doesn't have uh, anything here whereas the sine ones are odd. If I flip the sign of the argument, I get an overall minus sign. So far, so good? Okay. So, how to solve this problem numerically, right? So we, we solved so many times analytically that's kind of even hard to think of how would I do a numerical approach with this? Well, Schrodinger's equation has a second derivative. So let's start by asking ourselves, how would we take uh, a numerical derivative in this uh, setting, in this scheme that I mentioned, which is uh, the space is discretized and uh, I want to find out my wave functions at the lattice points, the value of my function at the lattice points, okay? So this is a problem pretty common in numerical calculus, which is you don't have a continuous function, but you have a function that you know at some discrete set of points. Right, I know the function of the, uh, these three points, xi, xi plus one, and xi minus one. And I'm, uh, somebody might ask me, what is the derivative at this point here, right? Which, if we had an analytical solution, would be a very simple question. But when we have points on a, on a graph, like how, how do I do this? One thing that you can do is uh, you can look at uh, the Taylor series of what happens when I expand around this point here plus a small quantity that I'm going to denote by H. So H is the equal spacing here between those points. And I had to use all fiber in my beam not to do H bar here, okay? So when you do the Taylor series expansion here, you get the function at point X, you get terms proportional to the first derivative, second, third, and so on, okay? Textbook uh, Taylor series expansion. What happens if I throw away terms with uh, h squared and higher orders, okay? If I do that, I can uh, solve for the first numerical derivative, uh, for the first derivative and get this expression here. That's an approximation because I'm throwing away terms, okay? but in terms of the function at that point and that in the next one. So it would be the function at this point and at the next one, okay? And uh, of course, H, we want 
to be a small quantity, so this is a good approximation. But if you take the limit of uh, h going to zero, that's the very definition of a derivative, right? So this must be a good first approximation for doing a, a derivative if you have something discrete and not continuous, okay? That there's nothing special about if I want to know the derivative here that I want to look at here in the next point. I could look at here and the previous point too, okay? That would work as well. So I do the Taylor series now for x minus this small quantity, okay? And then I do the same procedure. I throw away everything with uh, h square and higher orders, and I get this approximation here for the first numerical derivative. Okay? Yes. Continuous makes sense if you have uh, analytical continuous uh, functions that you know the value for every real value of x. Here, I just have a discrete set of points. Uh, the difference between, I don't know, a cosine and a sine that you get when you solve the problem analytically is this. And then when you're going to solve in your uh, program, you won't know the value of the function at all these points. You know at some specific values, probably equally spaced, but like that. You can control how uh, far or how close apart they are, because in your code, you can vary what's this distance. Of course, you, wanna, you want to do small, uh, small values of uh, the, the lattice spacing, so that these things are good approximations. If h is a, a, a big number, that might not be true, okay? I, I'm not saying that uh, this function has uh, the same derivative if you approach from the left or, or the right, because if you get, if you use this for a tangent, right, uh, a pi over two, which has a different value if you approach from one side and from another, if you use one definition or the other, you're going to get completely different results. Because what's the limitation here? The limitation here is the spacing between your points. You're never going to resolve anything between the spacing of your points. So in this tangent example that does like this and like this, or no, like this and right, um, you, can't, you can't know what's happening uh, in there because it's between two of your lattice points. So that's your spatial resolution, okay? Luckily for us, most problems in physics uh, are, are well-behaved and then don't suffer from many pathological mathematical uh, disease. But, um, but uh, you are correct. In, in many examples, as this tangent one that I, I mentioned, uh, you do have to worry about these things, okay? So keep in mind, but we, we won't see this problem here. Does that answer your question? More questions? Yes. Uh, what if the two points are not? It's, it's uh, uneven. I, you, you can, these expressions here, they, they become a little bit more complicated, but you, st you still can do it, okay? Uh, with weights and things like that. Yeah, that, uh, that's possible. Integrating, it's much easier uh, uh, using what you said. Deriving, it's a little bit trickier. But in this course, we're not going to see that. We're going to assume equally spaced points, okay? More questions? Okay. So I threw away everything that uh, had order uh, h squared, right, and uh, higher orders. Can I write expressions for the numerical derivative that are more precise? 
than this. Uh, hold on, can I close this? <laughs> this is not a physics problem. <laughs> Seems like it lost the connection and then the internet connection. So now I understand that everything that I'm saying is not going to be recorded, so it's going to be a, a more relaxed class. Of course I'm kidding, Homo. <laughs> it's going to be as serious as it was before. Okay, so I throw away everything that was order eight squared and higher orders. Can I do better than this? Can I come up with some expression that's similar to, to these, but I I, I get, uh, I include more orders. Yes, the answer is yes. If I take the two Taylor series of the previous uh, example, uh, uh, you can see that if I take their difference, uh, the terms with h square are going to cancel exactly. As a matter of fact, the all the even uh, powers are going to cancel uh, exactly. And then when I do this, I just have to throw away terms with uh, h cube and higher orders, okay? When I do this, I get this expression here. I can solve for the, uh, for the first derivative, and I get an expression that's symmetric with respect to the point that I want to calculate the derivative. So if I want to calculate the derivative at this point, I, I'm going to use the value of the functions at these other two points, okay? And for uh, uh, our friend here that asked uh, what happens w when you have functions that are weird around one point, if you use the three uh, definitions, you're going to have potentially three different results. For well-behaved functions and small values of h, uh, this one is going to be the one uh, that's more precise, okay? Can I use this expression everywhere? Can I always use this? Right? So I can't use at the end point of my grid because this, this is telling me to calculate the numerical derivative at one point, I need to know the function at both neighboring sites. But for the first point of the lattice and for the last one, I don't know, uh, I don't have neighbors, to one to my left and the other one to my right. So what do I do? Do I give up using this expression? Yes, right? So almost everywhere I use this expression, and then for the endpoints I use either this one or the other. Okay, makes sense? So this was the first derivative. In Schrodinger's equation, we need the second derivative, right? So I'm going to take those two Taylor series that I already wrote, and I'm going to sum them, because when I sum them, uh, I, I get the second derivative here, and the first one cancels. So their sum equals to this. If I throw away everything with h cube and higher, uh, sorry, h cube cancels exactly. Uh, if I throw everything away with uh, h to the fourth and higher orders, I get this uh, expression for the second derivative. If I want the second derivative at some point, I need the, to know the value of the function at that point and at the neighboring sites. Okay? So far, so good? All right. So let's go back to the problem that we want to solve. Yes? Oh. 
Okay, so uh, it's pretty much what I'm going to talk a uh, uh, now. So um, well, I I'll just continue with my lecture, and if that doesn't ask uh, answer your question, please let me know. But that's going to be uh, exactly the, the core of this method. I mean, we, we have to, to use this to, to get the, the answer, okay? So, patience. <laughs> okay, so I have my Schrodinger's equation here, second derivative here. I'm going to substitute that by that discretization that we just wrote, okay? So, I'm going to put the, the second derivative here. And then I'm going to rearrange the terms. And if I rearrange them uh, by solving for psi i plus one, I get this equation here. This equation here is telling me the following. If I know the value of the wave function at some lattice point i minus one and at the lattice i, I can use this to compute the wave function at i plus one. So you give me the value of the function at two points, and then I, I, I use this to get the next one. If I have the next one, I can repeat this indefinitely. Take two points, uh, I know the third. Then move, take two more points, uh, I know the third, okay? So if I keep applying this, I can solve my wave function on this lattice that we define, okay? So what's the complication? Uh, we need to know two points to start this method, okay? If we don't have these two values here, we cannot start the method. Of course, I don't need to walk in this direction. I can walk in the other direction. I can uh, flip i minus one and i plus one, and then if I know i and i plus one, for example, if I know at these two points, I can use this to calculate the wave function here, and then also walk in this direction, okay? Make sense? Okay. So as I said, you need two points to, to start, right? Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to care about the normalization right now. We know that Schrodinger's equation is linear in Psi. If I find some solution that sol solves our problem, um, a constant times that wave function also solves our problem, it just becomes a matter at the end, you can normalize your wave function at the very end, okay? So, if I don't care about the normalization, let's discuss the parity of the solutions that we had earlier. We had solutions uh, that were even, uh, the cosines, right? And what happens with the cosine? For x equals zero, we have some value, some constant value. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not setting this to one because, uh, as I said, I'm. Uh, we have to, to take into account nor the normalization. But I, I just need some constant value with uh, a, a zero derivative, right? Cosine is flat at the orange, okay? So, uh, can be any constant, I'm going to take it as one at the origin, okay? And then, the next point, I'm also going to take it as one, because if I take two consecutive points as being the same, if I use that expression for the numerical derivative here, I get a flat derivative, right? So these are the two points that I'm going to use to start my algorithm when I'm going to, uh, uh, to deal with even solutions, okay? Is everyone following? Okay. Mm. Yes, so if I have a potential that's, that has a definite parity, like the infinite square well, but it's not the only one, I always get solutions that have good parity, even and odd. What I'm saying is, this you can apply for any potential that you have uh, uh, even solution. Okay. And how about the odd solutions, the, the sine ones? Well, sine of zero is zero, otherwise I, I couldn't do this, okay? and uh, it has some derivative at the origin, some constant derivative. It's going up. So I can take my first point to be zero and the next point to be uh, delta x. Why I'm doing this, if you recall,
our approximation of the first uh, derivative near the origin. W what do, do I get? So this is equivalent to saying, oh, the derivative at the origin is one, some constant. It's just going upwards, okay? Does this make sense? Why did I uh, chose both to be one? Uh, I don't understand the question. Uh, is it uh, couldn't? Uh, uh, I'm motivating with the cosine, but this discussion is general to any even function. Uh, if I take both to be two going to work as well. If I take both to be square root of 2, it works too. If I take both to be pi, it's going to work. Uh, arbitrary point or value? Value, yes. Okay. As I said in the beginning of the class, we always want to work with uh, numbers that are not too big or too, uh, too large or, or, or too small in, in computers. That's the only reason why I chose one. Could be pretty much anything. Delta x and delta x is going to work just fine. M make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, I realized that afterwards, a bad notation. Uh, h and delta x are the same thing, OK? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, there's a disclaimer that I should have done about uh, this method. This method is just going to work for potentials that have definite parity. So, for example, the, the infinite well, if we write that way that I wrote with respect to zero, is going to be uh, uh, an even function of x, right? So this is going to work only for uh, this specific class of potentials. If you want to deal with some uh, potential that doesn't have this symmetry, there are other methods, but this one won't work. Okay? So this is not a general method. This is a specific method. Okay? Good. Okay, so I have an equation that if I give two, uh, two values of the wave function, two consecutive values of the wave function, I get a third. And I have two points to start my algorithm uh, for uh, both cases, uh, even solutions and odd solutions. Do I have everything that I need to solve my problem? Well, not yet. Because now the problem becomes this energy here. When you're solving uh, the Schrodinger equation, you, <coughs> you are solving for the wave functions, yes which are uh, eigenstates, but you also need the eigenenergies, right? So it's an uh, uh, eigenvalue, eigenvector uh, kind of problem. You're doing those things simultaneously, right? You want to know the energy associated with that particular uh, eigenstate. So we need some value e here to, to start our algorithm, okay? But at the same time, we want to determine e. So what can we do? This method that I'm going to talk about now, it's called the shooting method because it, it's similar to if you're shooting a cannon, you're shooting a cannonball from a cannon, and you want to hit a specific target. So I, I, I want to hit that chair over there. It's not every angle, every uh, velocity, initial velocity that's going to hit that chair. It has to be a really specific value. Here, it's the same idea. If I start my algorithm here at the middle of the box and walk towards, say, the, uh, the right side uh, of the well, what I want is I want my, uh, my wave function to go to zero precisely at the boundary of the well. 
Not before, not afterwards. I want it exactly at that point to be zero and to be zero uh, everywhere outside of the well. So it's like shooting a cannonball that I want to, to, to hit this x equals l here, okay? So that's where the, the name comes from. So what can we do? We start with a guess for my energy, okay? And then we can look at what happens with the solutions outside of the well, okay? What's going to happen? If I have energies that are smaller than the ground, I'm going to center my discussion around the ground state first, but this is valid for excited states as well. But uh, uh, for the first moment, let's think just about the ground state, okay? Uh, for energies uh, that are smaller than the ground state, this wave function is going to diverge upwards uh, outside of the well. For energies that are uh, over the energy of the ground state, that are uh, larger than the energy of the ground state, outside of the well, they are going to diverge downward, downwards. What's the way, uh, what's a possible way of seeing this? Imagine that we start with energy zero, okay? How does the, the solution look like? Any guesses? I'm going to help you guys. So our first two points are one and one, right? Because I'm dealing with an uh, even, uh, even solution, right? Two minus one, one, right? Uh, I have zero for my energy and the potential inside of the well is zero, right? So my third point is one. I keep repeating this. What I'm going to get? One, all ones, right? It's flat. It's just a straight line, okay? So uh, if I have zero energy, I would have this, okay? What happens when I go a little bit outside of the well for this case? I have a potential that's infinite here or very large, okay? With a minus sign here, but I also have a minus sign here. It's going to blow up upwards, okay? So I'll get the solution that's flat here and then it blows up upwards, okay? What happens if I increase a little bit this energy? It's not zero anymore, but it's a little bit uh, larger than zero. The function is going to do this. It's going to be pretty flat, but then it acquires some curvature until it's going to touch the walls of the well. It's going to be a little bit lower than the first case, but it's going to be, uh, it's, it's it's something like this picture here. At some point, it's going to blow up upwards, okay? If I guess exactly the correct energy, then it's going to hit zero here, okay? But by the same reasoning, if I go over this energy, then it's going to hit it here, okay? So does that make sense to you? All right, so just to recap, we're going to change, we're going to vary the energy, right? And uh, what ha might happen is it might blow up upwards or downwards, okay? Of course, we're not going to vary this continuously. We're going to do this in discrete increments. So if I start with zero, then my next step will be delta E, two delta E, three delta E, and, and so on, okay? So what's going to happen? I start with my wave function blowing upwards, okay? Then I do my next iteration, upwards, and the next, upwards, upwards, upwards. At some point, at some energy, it's going to blow up downwards. Then I say, okay, good. I know that my energy is between this and this, right? It must be. It's for one case, it's blowing up upwards, and for the other one, downwards. It's somewhere in between those two. If I did this, I could have an estimate based on this delta E that I'm using, okay? Next slide, I'm going to show something a little bit more sophisticated than that. But this thing that I just said would work uh, 
uh, would solve your problem, okay? Is it clear? D do you understand the kind of thing we're trying to do? Okay. So this is one possible uh, implementation of this uh, method. Uh, these slides are in the website, as I said, so I recommend you guys download them and you can use that while developing your code, okay? So, what does a generic program that solves this problem looks like? What's the input of my program? Well, you have to give the number of points that you want to discretize your wave function, or uh, you could, uh, uh, the same thing is to, to, to provide the, what's the spacing between the points, okay? Remember that in these dimensionless units, it's going to run from minus one to plus one, okay? Uh, then you also need to uh, provide the initial guess for the energy, okay? If you're looking for the ground state, it could be zero or it could be small numbers. Just make sure you don't go over the, the, the energy of the ground state. And then uh, you need two points, uh, as we discussed before, and these two points, uh, they depend on the desired parity that you're looking for. So if you're looking for the ground state, uh, you want an even state, uh, these two are going to be equal, and for example, equal to one, okay? Uh, this is going to be a, a little bit more sophisticated to what I, I said in the previous slide, because we're going to use <coughs> uh, an auxiliary variable here that I'm going to call last div, for less divergence, that's going to keep track if in the previous iteration it blew up upwards or, or, or downwards, okay? So, so this variable here you'll see in a minute, but it's related to, uh, uh, in the previous step, did the wave function go up or down, okay? Uh, and then, uh, what's the main loop of my, my program? You use E, uh, those two uh, points, psi zero and psi one, and then you compute the wave function uh, for all the points or for half of your well, okay? And then, uh, how do you do this? You use that equation that we derived, and then you get the, the, the value of the wave function at the next point, and you keep doing that, you can solve, you can get your wave function over all the, this half box, okay? Then you, you, you ask, uh, oh, one important thing, you, you should solve always a little bit more than the well so you can see if it's going up or down, okay? So don't stop your solution at the wall. Go a little bit further. I don't know, 1.1, 1.2, something like that, okay? Because you, the, the core idea of this method is to see what's going on outside of the well, okay? Then you ask yourselves, ourselves, uh, is Psi diverging to plus infinity or minus infinity outside the well? And then you compare with the sign of that variable that I said, less div, okay? If they have opposite signs, what does that mean? That means that between the last iteration and this one, uh, the energy of the ground state must be between those two because one of them was going up and the other one down, or the other case, one was going down and the other one is going up. So my energy must be between those two values, okay? If I do that, if I stopped here, I could have a precision of delta E of where my energy is, okay? But if we do this here, uh, we are going to improve on that. I substitute my value of delta E for delta E over two and flip the sign. So what does that mean? I started with zero and I was going up in the energy. At some point, I found the ground state. I went over it, okay? So my ground state is between here and here. Then I say, okay, I was going up and it's between here and here. So let me go in the middle now and start going down, okay? So it's like binary search. So if you have, uh, if you're looking for a root of a function in an interval, you go to the midpoint and look for here, then you go for the midpoint and so on. Same idea here. It's between this and this. I was moving in this direction. I went past it. Let me go to the middle and move in the other direction. 
and then I'm going to keep doing this. Delta E is going to get smaller and smaller. At some point, I say, OK, I'm happy with this precision that I have. I stop my code. OK? So this is an alternative to do this in a more, to get more precision, do this different from using a fixed, really small delta E. This way, I can start with a large delta E and then just make it small, close to my solution. What is considered uh, small enough? Depends on your problem. What precision do you want your ground state energy? 10%, 1%, 0.1%? It's up to you. Y you tell me, and then you'll find it with the, the precision. OK? I think in my examples, I stopped at 0.1% because I said, OK, this is, this is fine. I'm not searching for you know, gravitational waves. OK. So then I update my energy with the, uh, with the new gas, which is the old one plus delta E. And this delta E might be the one that I started with or might be the one that's going smaller and uh, smaller and getting smaller and smaller. OK. I update the last div with plus or minus sign, meaning uh, is it blowing upwards or downwards, OK? Uh, if delta E is small enough, I say, OK, this value of the energy is acceptable within my, my tolerance. Uh, I, I stop this loop. Otherwise, I repeat the pr this process. Is this clear? Does that make sense? Yes? Any questions? OK. It could. The tolerance is always up to you. It's a user defined uh, quantity. So you can implement uh, 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 a program that you say, OK, my in these reduced units, my tolerance is delta E equals to 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. You could define it this way. Uh, you could say it's a relative uh, quantity, a relative tolerance. It's up to you. The second? Uh -huh. So for our computers, there is no infinite, but there is always very large. Okay. So if you're computing energies that are order one, and you say that the potential outside the, the box is 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 10, that's, that's infinite. Uh, uh, zero and infinite are things that we have when we're doing uh, calculations. There are not things that occur in nature. In nature, you have really large compared to something or really small compared to something. Yes. Yes, like a huge number. Uh, OK, depending on the programming language that you're using and the precision the of the variables that you're using, you always have to be careful not to put numbers that are larger than the largest number that thing can store. Uh, I'm old. I could show you some slides on how to do that in Fortran. OK, but you guys don't like Fortran. You guys like Python and, <laughs> and things like that. But uh, that's something that you always have to be mindful, that you can not store uh, arbitrarily large or small things in, in variables. OK? All right. And one of the reasons that I chose this, uh, this problem for you guys to, uh, to, to work on is that I think pretty much everyone in this room knows what the correct result is, know what the solution looks like. So uh, it's, I hope that's easy for you when you press enter, uh, that you'll know if the result's correct or not, OK? OK. So this is one example here. Uh, in these reduced units, uh, my, my ground state energy is a pi square over 8. That's 1.2 something. Uh, 
outside of the well, here I used uh, the potential outside uh, the, the well is 1,000, okay? I used 1,000 not because it's a good approximation here, but I use it, otherwise you couldn't see clearly uh, this divergence here because it would blow up or down, it's really quick. So just for the this picture here, I, I put 1,000 here, okay? And then you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so the energy is 1.2. I, I picked two energies here to show you. One it's one, it's uh, uh, smaller than the ground state energy, it's blowing up upwards, and this one is diverging downwards because it's larger than the ground state energy, okay? So when you're writing your program, something like this could help you see if things are working or not. Can everyone see that? Okay, so I kept saying, well, we are going to worry about the normalization later. Well, now it's later. We're going to worry about the normalization, okay? Uh, so we have the solution, but uh, we still need to normalize according to this. So it's the problem analogous to this one in numerical calculus, but not when you want to uh, take the derivative, but when you want to know the area under this curve here, okay? So the problem becomes of uh, becomes uh, if I have equally spaced points here and I have uh, my positions here and my wave functions, uh, the values uh, of the wave function are, are known uh, on this lattice, what's the area under this curve? Well, the simplest thing that I could do is put a straight line here between these two points, okay? And then uh, the problem becomes computing this area here that looks like a trapezoid, right? So the first uh, expression that you might see in a textbook, in a numerical calculus textbook, would be something like this. I'm approximating the area between two points, x1 and x2, by a trapezoid. So uh, I have the larger base, uh, bases plus the smaller one times half, uh, divided by half, divided by two, uh, and times the height. Okay, it's the area, uh, uh, it was confused, but it's the area of a trapezoid. Uh, this is for two points. If I apply this for all the intervals, so this one, this one, and all of them, I get this, uh, uh, this rule that's approximating uh, this integral from some x1 to xn you see that the endpoints get the half factor, but the ones in the middle, you always have like half f2 plus half f2, half f3 plus half f3, so that all these ones here don't, don't get a half, only the ones in the, at, at the endpoints, okay? This is the simplest thing that you could do. First implementation of the code, I suggest you do something like this. But you can always ask me, okay, can I do better than this? Yes, you can do the better than this. One that's a little bit more sophisticated would be, uh, a, so we did a linear interpolation, the next one would be a quadratic interpolation. So if I know uh, the function at three points, uh, I could approximate them by this, and this is called Simpson's rule, okay? And if I use it repeatedly, you'll see that the endpoints get this factor one third here, one third here, and inside here, I, I get this alternating 4 and 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, okay? This would also be an approximation for this integral, okay? So this is the numerical solution that I get from my code if I use these parameters. I'm using some spacing of 10 to the minus 3 in these reduced units. Uh, my tolerance for the energy is 10 to the minus 3, or 4, or 10 to the minus 3. Uh, inside of the well, I used uh, my definition of infinite here is 10 to the 6, okay? Uh, the ground state energy analytically would be 1.234. I get 1.231, so my error is of the order of 0.1% with these parameters. If I tweak these parameters, I can do better or worse, okay? And then uh, I normalize the ground state and be careful when you do this. Remember that 
everything outside of the well you have to throw away. It was really important for us to keep track if it was diverging upwards or downwards, but now that we found the solution, we know that the, the, the wave function is zero outside. So when you're normalizing, remember to throw that away. Okay? And then we get to the, the project that, that we are going to start tomorrow, okay? But uh, if you like this, you, you can go back to the hotel tonight and think about it. You don't have to work, just think about it. <laughs> and so the idea is, let's write a program using the shooting method that solves uh, the Schrodinger's equation for the time-independent Schrodinger equation for one particle in 1G with this uh, infinite square well, okay? And your program should receive as input what's the parity of the states that uh, you're looking for, okay? First thing, let's work with the ground state. So find the ground state energy uh, and the wave function, okay? Then you can play a little bit with the parameters and see what does it do with the precision of your results, okay? Uh, and you can also, uh, you know what the analytical solution is in this case. I ask you to do uh, a figure, a graph of the difference between the numerical solution and the uh, analytical one as a function of x. And I ask you, do these things agree? What's the error, okay? And then, once this thing is working for the ground state, you can think of how to extend this code to find the uh, excited state, okay? So I'm saying here four, but you can do as many as you want. Uh, and then uh, you have the energies, uh, you will have the energies and you know the analytical result, compare them and tell me what's the relative error. So this is the exercise. I leave, I leave here uh, some extra, some bonus questions just for you to, uh, they're more for you to think, not to, to actually do some calculations. And I realized that during the class I may have given the answers to these questions. Uh, but first question is, pick your favorite quantum mechanics textbook or modern physics textbook and compare the analytical solutions for the infinite and finite square well. So the finite square well is zero inside the well and some V0 outside of the well. Uh, the infinite uh, case is the special case where this is this V0 goes to infinity, right? So compare the analytical solutions of these two uh, problems. And then I ask you, what changes would you have to make to consider this other potential in our code, okay? Think about it. And then the second one is, what are examples of other potentials that can be solved with this method? And also some examples of potentials that cannot and why? Is it clear what we are going to do tomorrow? Yes? Uh, any questions overall? Yes? Okay, so we talked a lot about the ground state, which is an even solution. The first excited state is going to be odd. So you need to change your starting points. Remember, for the cosine, it's one and one. For the sine one, it's going to be uh, zero and some small number, right? So this is one thing. But these two classes are common for all the excited states. They are always going to alternate between even and odd, right? So uh, what you can do is you start with some really low energy, it would be zero, and you move upwards. The first state we're going to find is the ground state. The second one is the first one, and you keep increasing. Then your question could be, how do I know if I missed one state? Right, if you use big values of delta E, y you might miss one state. Uh, do you guys know one thing that we can use to, to know which state I'm looking at? I can look at the nodes of the, the number of nodes of the wave function. The ground state, I never count the, the walls and as nodes, okay? So forget about the, the zeros of the walls because they are always there. If I have the ground state, how many nodes does it have? Zero. First excited state, one. Second, 
So if you look at the solution, you always know which states you're talking about, and if you missed some. Okay? Any more questions? Hmm? No, you can do this to potential that you don't know the solution. Th this criteria about the number of nodes always works. The number of nodes. Yeah. Uh, the concept of even and odd uh, only exists for these types of, of potentials that have definite parity. And most of them are going to be even. Yes. And, uh, and you, uh, after we, we've taken this lecture, seen this lecture, we realized that this parity was used to get two points to start my algorithm, right? So the question becomes, okay, if I, um, if I have some potential that doesn't give me these two points in this way, how can I think about the problem a little bit and find two points to start my algorithm? Uh, if we have time, I, I can comment on the, lex uh, on the last lecture about uh, one method that does that, it's called matching method, uh, that works for arbitrary potentials. Okay. More questions? No, everybody's hungry, right? All right, thank you for your time. <laughs>